Hi everyone, welcome to Table Talk Back. My name is Rodney Smith and in a moment I want to talk to you about some of the responses that I've received on the question, what kickstarts you? In other words, what do you like to see in a Kickstarter campaign? Maybe what are some of the things that turn you off about them? But first, I just wanted to go back to a previous episode where we talked about, you know, do you buy toys for your toys? In other words, do you pimp out your games a little bit? And I've been doing this recently. I was upgrading the components to my Game of Thrones second edition board game. And I had shown you guys that I had replaced the cardboard sword and the cardboard crow, but I had not found a good replacement for the Iron Throne. And look what I got. <laughs> A very talented, very kind viewer, Angela Beagle, sent me this custom-made Iron Throne. I mean, look at this thing. It's, it's, it's awesome. And I just like, I thought this really deserved a public acknowledgement. I just wanted to say, Angela, thank you so much for saying this to me. It's going to look great on the table. I can't wait to use it. Again, again, thank you so much. But right now, let's talk a little bit about your feelings about Kickstarter. So Gabriel Conolito is going to start us off. He says, I like to see a video of gameplay where you get to see the components and after that I put weight on my follow-up questions. If they never answer, that's a warning sign. You know, I think maybe one of the, the most popular complaints I see about Kickstarter is that after the campaign ends, communication from the campaign runners just seems to fall off a cliff. It, it reminds me of when you travel by a plane. You know, they're very keen to get you to buy the ticket, but then once you're stuck in the airport waiting for your connecting flight and the flight's been canceled or delayed, suddenly you don't feel like they care so much about you because they've got your money, right? I think, I, I just would love to see more campaigns just get in the habit of maintaining regular scheduled communication with the backers. Listen, why not make it every week? Every week you're going to post some kind of update, even if it's just to say nothing's happening. Then again, if a whole week has passed and nothing has happened, <laughs> that's kind of a concern too, don't you think? Lalkin says, Kickstarter is a glorified pre-order. I don't pre-order games or anything else. I've been burned by pre-orders so many times in the past decade. When they're done, I'll take a look, and if it's worth the money, I'll buy it. You know, we had really interesting timing with this particular topic because just shortly thereafter, there was a game that had been funded on Kickstarter called The Doom That Came to Atlantic City. It funded over 100 grand. And an update was released on that Kickstarter saying, you know what, um, this project is not going to go through. We've taken the money and we basically spent it all. Uh, good luck to you. There was some talk about, you know, vague conversation about returning people's money, but what are the odds on that? Because it certainly looks like the money had been spent. Even the designers of the games themselves hadn't been paid because they didn't run the campaign. It was the campaign runners who seemed to have taken the money and literally run away with it. This story does have kind of a happy ending, mind you, because uh, Cryptozoic, uh, a pub publisher of, of board games and card games, stepped in and said they would publish this game and then supply copies to the backers. When I read that, I, I had to read it twice. Is there hope for humanity? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but that seems like a step in the right direction. And certainly a very nice thing for Cryptozoic to do, and I hope they, they certainly get some benefit out of their, their efforts to save this project and, and, to, and to do right by these backers. It's, it's certainly, I would think, very goodwill that's being generated on their part. But let's stay on this pre-order criticism a little bit here. Cthulhu123 says, I don't use Kickstarter, but what does annoy me is when I see a company like Days of Wonder using it for funding, and surely they can fund their own projects. I don't think big established companies should be allowed to use it. Honestly, I, I felt this way too. When I first uh, discovered Kickstarter, I thought, this is great. Here's a place, a safe haven for individual small companies with an innovative idea to bring their idea into fruition because you know, they wouldn't normally be able to have access to the capital they would need to produce their product or service or, or whatever it is. But now, of course, what's happening is a lot of large companies are, <laughs> are funding entire movies uh, that movie studios used to pay for and all kinds of other things. And as we're seeing it in the board game world as well. Now that said, honestly, my feeling on it today is that this ship has sailed. Kickstarter is a tool at the end of the day, and whatever its original intentions or the spirit of it was, at the end of the day here, it's just a tool, and it's a tool that can be used by small businesses and large businesses alike, and I think that's just kind of a reality we have to face. There is kind of an upside to larger companies using Kickstarter, because if you like the whole Kickstarter process, but you're not a big fan of the um, uncertainty uh, that certain projects may not get funded, 
when it's a larger established company running a Kickstarter, there's, there's pretty good odds that it will get funded because they already have quite a following that will be interested in investing in the product. I mean, that may not be enough of an upside for some people, but it's, it's, it's something. Now, Cartoons 80s, 90s said, I would only support a Kickstarter board game campaign for the extras and the exclusive content. Magic Seer said, important to me is the stretch goals. They don't have to be exclusive, but give me bonuses for helping fund your game. If not, I'll wait for them to hit the stores and I'll usually be able to find them at a cheaper price. <laughs> I, I saw this sentiment echoed throughout many, many of the responses. And listen, I have to agree, that's really the reason why I often get excited about backing something on Kickstarter because you go in at a fixed price. Maybe you, you say, okay, $50, I'm in. And you know what you're getting, it's a box of goodies. Then as time goes on, that the box keeps getting packed full of more and more things as those stretch goals are reached. And then you want to tell more and more people about it because you want more and more funding to come in so more stretch goals are unlocked. So that $50 you spent feels like it's suddenly, you know, you're getting more and more, you're, you're, you're making money on your investment. Now, a lot of this can be set up as a bit of a psychological trick. I mean, the company knows it's going to reach those goals. So they kind of, they set it at a certain level that they, they realize if we get at least this number of backers, which we believe we will, this is how much we can pack into the box. But they kind of trail it out a little bit. But no matter how they do it, it does end, it's a lend a certain amount of, of excitement to the entire process. Now, that said, uh, David Christensen says, I, I take a look at the project stretch goals when deciding if I will kickstart a game. The stretch goals need to be something that adds value to the game. Council of Verona stretch goals included fifth player expansions, upgraded components, Poison expansion, player mats, I don't need another t-shirt, <laughs> seriously. Now, I don't mind when Kickstarters have some of those extra things you can purchase with additional donations, like a t-shirt or post or whatever, but really the stretch goals that I want to see are things that add to the gameplay, get me more and more excited about the game itself. Now, David Gregg says, for myself, I'll initially back a game that's themed in a way that I enjoy and appears to have solid mechanics. However, during the course of the campaign, I'll cancel my pledge if the rules are not made available or if after reading them, I decide the game isn't for me. So this is one of the nice things about Kickstarter, isn't it? You can get excited about a game, you can back it, you can kind of get sucked in, but if the campaign fails to hold your interest, and that's something campaign runners really need to keep an eye on, you know, do you have enough here to not just get people's interest but then keep it over the course of the campaign? You know, this is a great opportunity for you as a donator to say, and maybe even have some influence in the game itself by saying, listen, I'm a backer, but this is what I want to see in the game or I might withdraw my donation. And so I think including rules is, is a really good thing for campaign runners to do. Now, Rock X Heroes says, you don't get to see the rule books in games at a store before you buy it. So, you know, is having the rules included really that important? Well, I think it is actually. I believe that Kickstarter, a lot of the board games that get back there are backed by us board gaming enthusiasts, we're, you know, we're not the ones probably that go into Toys R Us looking for our games and, and picking just random Hasbro games off the shelves, nothing against those games, but we're, we're probably a little more invested in the games, in the gaming community. We have a little more awareness about what's new, what's hot, what, what the expectations are about the different styles of games, etc. So one of the things that's currently in gaming culture, I believe, is that rule books are made publicly available to download without you having to purchase the game first. A lot of publishers understand this and that means a lot of us as, as consumers understand it as well. So it concerns me when a Kickstarter campaign doesn't provide the rules because in a way it, it suggests to me that they're a little bit out of touch with the, the gaming community itself and I have to wonder, you know, what kind of development has your game gone through if you, you're really you know, not that in tune with the gaming community and what the norms are, what the expectations are, which I would think includes getting that rule book in advance. David Brown says, I have to say, I seriously doubt I'd ever invest in a crowdfunding project. Now, having said that, there's the issue of games like Zombicide now being really hard to find. That's perhaps the only reason I'd back something, knowing I might not be able to find it later on. Now, this is kind of a tough one. I, I've heard Tom Vassell of the Dice Tower talk about this before. I think he suggested that if a game is really good, if it's of, of good quality, then it will be available uh, beyond the Kickstarter and it will be reprinted because that popularity will, will keep it in print. I think that's mostly true. I actually agree with Tom on that, but I do think it's a little easier for the Toms and the Rodneys of the world to kind of feel that way about it when we have collections that kind of grow and grow because of the nature of, of the work that we do. If you're somebody who gets maybe five to 10 games a year and one of those Kickstarter games feels like it would be like a perfect fit for you, 
then I could see you having a little more anxiety about, you know, missing out on that opportunity to get the game. Because it's true, sometimes even really good games do go out of print. Super Cheese says, I've never backed anything on Kickstarter for one reason. I'm not going to give money I don't have to someone I don't know for something that doesn't exist yet. <laughs> no offense to anyone who has. But for someone on a budget like myself, I don't have money to throw at something I want and hope to get in six months or even a year. Listen, that's perfectly reasonable. Kickstarter is kind of like throwing your money into a, a pit and hoping eventually something good's going to pop back out of it that's equivalent to the money you, you put into it. There's no guarantees, and certainly if you're on a budget or otherwise. I mean, there's no point in throwing money at something you're not confident in. Barry Hood says, I rarely watch Kickstarter videos as they often contain no useful information about the project and instead are just marketing fluff. Every project should consider having both gameplay and review preview videos linked from the homepage right from day one. Honestly, I don't mind the fluff. That's typically what will draw me into a game, finding a theme, trying to find something to get me sort of excited on a, a surface level about the game. That's what, what draws me in typically. But I agree. I mean, if you want my money, what you're going to need to do beyond that is actually show me something of, of substance, especially now that I've been burned on, on a couple of Kickstarters. But here's the thing, I, I think that if you do not have a review or preview video with your Kickstarter day one or, or at least week one, it also suggests you're not really prepared. I have to wonder what kind of development process you've been going through because again, this is something that's becoming the norm within the gaming community, it's something we expect to see and there are lots of very good quality reviewers and Kickstarter previewers who will offer their services to you. So there's not really a, a great excuse not to have one. now. <laughs> Speaking of which, Clinton Coddington says, Yes, Rodney, please do not become a Kickstarter preview channel. Honestly, uh, Clinton, this is something for the last few months I've been thinking about, trying to figure out how could I fit some Kickstarter projects onto my channel, because like it or lump it, Kickstarter is becoming a, a big part of how board games are made, and may maybe it's the future. I, I don't know. but. Here's the thing, no matter what angle I've approached it from, I just have not found a way that I'm comfortable with, that I feel like fits the context of the series as it was created and, and sort of how I've always intended it to be. So for the time being, no, I will not be featuring Kickstarter projects on our series. Now that said, I always like to break all of my rules at least once, <laughs> so I will warn you. There is a Kickstarter project that I know about that I, I will probably be making a video for this year. It's, it's one, it's by a publisher that, that I have some, some, uh, some appreciation for, I, I believe in the, in the product, and so uh, I believe you will see one, one Kickstarter video from me, and hopefully that ratio of one in a year won't, won't be too upsetting to anybody, and, uh, and uh, as I say, my preference as well is for published games that are already available that you guys can then go out and buy yourselves. If you, if you like what you see on our series, my hope is that you can then go in and start enjoying that product yourself if it's something that appeals to you. Finally, Punk V 1987 says, I have backed an Indiegogo project called Watch It Played Season 3, which I believe is a pretty good gaming show on YouTube. <laughs> All right. You didn't think I was going to have this topic and, and not plug our fundraiser just a little bit, did you? Listen, right now we do have a fundraiser over at Indiegogo for Season 3 of Watch It Played. If this is a show that you've enjoyed, if it has some value to you, then I would certainly appreciate your contribution to our fundraiser. It helps me be able to keep doing this, and I certainly do love it. I hope that you will have an opportunity to pick out maybe a couple of persons on that page that you'd like. I'm really excited about these visionary perk levels. This is an opportunity for you to pick up a digital print uh, of commissioned artwork that I had done from moments from our playthrough. So these are moments that you shared with us. So maybe you watched our Mice and Mystics playthrough. This is a moment that you remember. We also had one done for Zombie Side, another one done for Summoner Wars, and from Mansions of Madness, Harvey Walters beating a cultist just like he was born to do. But as I say, you know, whether you see value in the perks or not, my hope is that if you see value in the show, that would be a reason for you to donate. But either way, I'm just glad that you're here, you're watching, and right now what I want to do is leave you with a few segments of the video responses we received to this topic. I hope you enjoy those. Until the next episode, thanks for watching. Hey, Watch It Played, it's Keith Collins again. Um, why do I back Kickstarter projects? I tend to back games that I think I'm really going to enjoy, um, that need help to be made, 
or games that tend to have a wow factor. Uh, I'm back somewhere in the neighborhood of 65 projects at this point, but I'm starting to become more choosy. Um, recently, not as much as in the past. I'm still feeding that monkey on my back at this point, but he's getting less treats than normal. Uh, I do feel that it needs to be said today, um, after the project, uh, the Cthulhu Monopoly one, they officially said today that uh, it's over. The dream has ended. They shall be refunding their Kickstarter backers. They made $120,000, used part of the money to set up their company. Probably should have done that before. They used part of the money to move the main game designer back to Portland. Probably shouldn't have done that on your Kickstarter backer money. And uh, generally, just team didn't work out. Uh, there were some rumors of legal issues, because if you're going to rip off a board game, you might not want to pick on Hasbro. They have a legal department. Have I kickstarted anything? No. Will I kickstart something? Maybe. Um, I've come close to kickstarting. The game that piqued my interest was Zaya. And I thought, what a fantastic game. It appeals to me in so many levels. Um, and I looked at the price, and it's 120 euros for a game with postage and packaging. Okay, let's see what the stretch goals are. So I waited, looked at the stretch goals. They seemed quite reasonable, and as they went on, they reached all their stretch goals. But I didn't feel like getting a tile, an extra ship here and there, and... and then changing the currency into real metal was worth that money, that 120 euros. I'd rather go out and buy Galaxy Truckers with Agricola, uh, with Cosmic Encounter. So I'd get three different games for the same amount of money. Uh, yes, there is that uniqueness that no one else in the world probably has this game. But you've got to justify the means of that money. Another example, a friend of mine in France, he kickstarted Zombieside, that's the one. And there were stretch goals and stretch goals and stretch goals and stretch goals and stretch goals upon stretch goals. And that is a justified means to an end. I don't really want to get Zombieside because I'm happy with Last Night on Earth. But maybe the next Zombieside uh, I might look into or definitely probably catch... Uh, and Alien Frontiers, if that comes for the fifth time, because I missed that one as well. Zoot.